Most of you know this is our foyer coming into our church building, and I just thought I'd show you something familiar uh, before we begin this video. Uh, we're going to be talking about the the family that we have. We have this tree for all of our members, and just thought you might be able to see that, yes, there's a lot of people who are connected here, and that uh, they're all still here. And so I'm glad you're joining us today. It's been very confusing lately, and it's just one of those times where we have to make the best of things. We're told to stay indoors, and yet in Arizona, at least, we're also told to go outside. And so it's hard to stay inside while going out. So I got the best of both today. We're in front of the tree that holds our membership, but we're still indoors. So I just want you to know I'm safe and protected. So it's good to see you. This is the number three video for the Wednesday night Bible study. And I'm excited to bear, share with you some things about faith. There is a time when we think about faith that we believe, but a lot of other people don't believe. And so while we may know exactly what we think and that we do believe in God, other people may not realize that at all. And they might be very against God and sometimes even bitter or angry at God for some of the things that have happened. Even Jesus ran into times when people didn't believe who he was and what he said. And it was the people who seemed to know him the most that did this. I want to share a passage with you today. The passage is Luke 4, starting with verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found a place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. He has set to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And so Jesus is coming home. If there's ever a place where people should believe it's the people who know you the best. And it's the people where you would come home and they would ask, what have you been doing? And you would tell them and they would believe you. They would know who you are. They would know your background. They would know what you're capable of. They've seen you grow up. And so it should be a huge advantage to talk to the people at home. They really want you to do well. They want good things to happen. And so when you really think about it, it's one of those things that seems very, very important to us, that the people that we know best would believe us. And so Jesus goes back to his hometown. And as usual, he goes to church. Well, he goes to the synagogue, which was their form of church. And he stands up to read, and he's given the scroll, and he finds the place in Isaiah where it talks about him. And he reads to them this passage that describes him, and it's even written in the first person. And it describes some of the things about him and some of the things that he's going to do, that he will proclaim liberty to the captives, that he will be the one who delivers people and rescues people and provides good things for people. What a great passage this is as he's able to explain, this is what's going to happen. And it's all in first person. I will do this for you. That must have been a great time as they listened to this and heard the words of Isaiah that had been written a thousand years before. And every eye was on Jesus. Everyone was watching him. He had authority like never before. He had grown up, he had come back home, and here he was able to be in their religious assembly and read with such power. And yet Jesus doesn't stop there. 
it's not just a matter of him being able to read scripture to them. He begins to tell them the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, the scripture is about him. And he begins to tell them the scripture is about me. And so it's not just enough for them to read the scripture. Now he wants them to know that this scripture is about him and that it's been fulfilled. I don't know if you've ever had a time where you have felt like scripture is fulfilled for you exactly where you are and exactly in the time where you are. And that you could say this passage that was written so many years before is about me. I don't think most of us have that. And yet Jesus was able to have that. Jesus is able to say, this passage is about me. This passage is about what I am and what I am doing. And so that must have been an exciting thing for them. Not only for Jesus to be back, for him to be able to read, for him to have such a powerful lesson, and uh, they're all talking well about him. How great this is. It's great for him to be back. It's great that he's able to be there and share with them. And uh, it was a very encouraging message because the passage in Isaiah talks about delivery and it talks about release and it talks about healing and it talks about all these good things that come from God. And they've heard the stories about Jesus. They've heard about his healing of other people in other places. And they've heard about some of the miracles that he's done as he begins his ministry. And so now he's back home and they want to hear those same things. The passage is from Luke 4, 22. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me the proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard that you did in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Everybody liked the sermon. I mean, everybody, it says all of them. And that never happens. There's usually somebody who's got a criticism or a explanation of, well, you could have done better, and I wish you had done this, or I wish you had done that. That's just part of public speaking, and it just happens to us all the time. But everybody liked this until they start realizing who it is who's speaking. They're glad Jesus is back, and yet they say, well, this is Joseph's son. This is the carpenter's son. And they may begin to wonder, where did he get all of this? How is he so smart? How does he know all of this? How is it that he's able to do all these things? And they are questioning this somewhat in their mind, thinking about who Jesus is. Well, Jesus is way ahead of them. And so he's already going to respond to them. He says, it's like someone saying to a physician, heal yourself. Would you go to a doctor that's sick? You usually want a doctor to be well. And anytime we would go to a doctor, we expect him to be well, even if we are sick. And if you go to a doctor that's sick himself, we just wouldn't trust him. And so he knows the anticipation. He knows what they're going to ask is, well, is this going to work for you, Jesus? Are you the one who's able to do all these things? And, you know, if you're the one who's really in control of all this, well, then why don't you do some of those miracles here? Why don't you do some of those things now? And they think they're in for a good time. After all, if he is just Joseph's son and not someone important, then it doesn't matter. But if he really is able to do all these miracles, then perhaps we should... Uh, at least engage him and say, well, why don't you do those things here? And that's exactly what they're looking for is, Jesus, why don't you start with us? We've heard you've been at Capernaum. We've heard you've done great miracles there. You've healed people. Jesus, empty out the hospital. 
put the doctors out of work. We won't have a sick person in all of Nazareth. Why don't you go ahead and heal now and heal all the people around here who are sick? And that will make all the difference for us. And so just think about what that means. No more lepers, no more blind, no more lame. No more victims of accidents or things that went wrong. In fact, everything in life will be perfect because if it's not, Jesus can heal it. And so they're looking at the results and they're looking at the things Jesus can do and they're looking at the way that he could benefit them. And if there ever was a coronavirus back then, then certainly Jesus would be able to heal it. I know there's lots of prayers now that Jesus would heal it. But as you look at this whole situation, they're thinking about what Jesus can do for them. They aren't really thinking about who Jesus is or what Jesus stands for. They're thinking about, well, how can it benefit me? What difference does it make for me? And so as they think about this and as they talk to Jesus, well, this is great. He's here. He's a person who has great wisdom and knowledge and healing power, and so he can solve all of our problems. And so many times that's the way we approach God. We want God to be the guy who solves all of our problems. We want him to take away any difficulty or discomfort that we might have. And if we could just get God to do that, then we would believe that God is for us, that God is with us, and Why wouldn't God want that? You see, for some reason, Jesus is already starting to tell them, a prophet doesn't have any honor in his hometown. Well, why not? They know him the best. But they're also the most familiar. And so as familiar as they are, they are not going to believe great things. They're going to look at what he can do. They're going to be result-oriented. They're looking for what can he do for me. And every single case is a test. And so if God is able to do something for me, then I'll believe in God. And if God is not willing to do something for me, then I'm not sure I believe in God anymore. And so it's not so much about a great faith in God. It's more a great faith in what we want for us. It's a way of saying, you know, God, if you'll give me what I want, then that's what I'm going to believe. But God is looking for bigger faith than that. That is way too small. And Jesus is not going to just leave it. He is going to challenge them and challenge their idea of faith. It will make a difference in what they believe. Jesus is trying to say, this is about me. The sermon is about himself. It's not enough for them to just believe in the word of God. It's not enough for them to just believe that God's able to heal and perhaps that Jesus might be able to heal a few sick people and solve a few problems that they have. If that's our concept of God, then it's way too small. Because what Jesus is trying to do is say, this passage talks about who I am am. And you need to understand and believe in me. It's great that you like the sermon, but I want you to be able to believe in me. And this passage and the scripture and the sermon is about me as Jesus explains this. And so as he tries to tell them this, they are really not getting it. It is very difficult for them as it is for us when we know someone very, very well. It's hard to accept their greatness, and certainly that's the problem they're having with Jesus. It comes down to this. Who Jesus is is more important than what he does. I'm not sure if we really want that or not. If you could have a God who would come in and heal everything in your life, every sickness you ever have, and solve every problem, is that the God that you would want? Most of us would say, yes, that's exactly the God that I would want. That's who I want to be my God, because he would take care of me. He would solve my problems. He would 
cause me to have a great life. And anytime anything went wrong, then he would be able to fix it. And I would be great. And that's not the point of faith. The point of faith is that God is great, not us. And so we're looking at it from the wrong perspective. It's not just about us being great, but about God being bigger than who we are. Because if our only intention is for God to make this life easy, we certainly have too small a God and too small a faith. Jesus is trying to say, I am the Son of God. I am God come down to earth. I am God in the flesh. And trying to get them to understand and believe that he is bigger than what he does. God is not just about the prayers he answers. He is not just about the blessings he gives. God is so much bigger than that. And Jesus goes on to tell a couple stories that will illustrate what this is all about. We need big faith. Jesus is talking about who he is and not just what he can do for us. And so when we understand God, we need to believe in a God who is bigger than just the sum of his works. Is that all you want people to believe you are? That you are nothing more than the time when you were employed on your job and that you are worth nothing more than what you did in that job? And if you produced a lot of widgets, then you were a good guy who could produce widgets. And that's about it. There's nothing more to you than what you did on your job. That's like what we would be saying to God when we would say, our faith in you is determined by the things that you do for us. And so if you will do a lot of good things for us and solve a lot of issues for us, then We believe in you and we think you're great. God is so much bigger than just the what he does. The same way you are so much bigger than what you do. It may be that people recognize you for playing sports. And they think you are the best home run hitter on the team. But that's not all you are. And if every time they see you and refer to you and think of you, that's all they think you can do. Well, that's a good thing, and it's even praised. But that's not everything that you are. And so we are much bigger than the works that we do, and God is much bigger than the works that he does as well. He wants us to believe in him, and that there is so much more to him. And that kind is a relationship that we're able to have, not just a wish list of getting the things that we would want. And so Jesus begins to talk about faith, and he gives them an example of what God looks for when he sees a person of great faith. Luke chapter 4 and verse 25. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath, to the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. What was Jesus trying to say with these stories? The first story is about a widow who lives in Zarephath and Elijah who was sent to her. There had been no rain because Elijah had prayed for three and a half years. It was a very wicked time in the life of Israel, and they had not done well. And Elijah was trying to bring about their repentance. And so it had been a time before they had ever responded to God. And of course, any time Elijah prays for it not to rain, the drought was great. There was no crops. And this is going to mean Elijah doesn't have anything to eat either. And he sent to a widow in Zarephath. If you look at the passage in 1 Kings 17, it tells that God sent Elijah there to someone who would take care of him. It sounds like it's been all arranged. It sounds like she knows that he's coming. It sounds like she has a supply of food and that she will be able to provide for him. And so sure enough, Elijah goes and he comes to Zarephath. But what he finds is a woman who is gathering sticks in the courtyard. That's it. 
gathering sticks. And so he asked for a drink of water. And he asked for her to bring him a drink of water. And as she turns to go, he says, and by the way, bring me a cake. Okay. She turns back to him and says, I only have one handful of flour and just enough oil to make one cake for myself and for my son. And then we are going to die. And she is gathering sticks to be able to cook the very last meal that she and her son will ever have. It's tragic. It's awful. And then Elijah does something that seems so uncaring and so unfeeling. He says to her, don't be afraid. I guess that's kind of an odd way to say it, but that's what he says. Don't be afraid. I want you to go and make me a cake first out of what you have. You have one handful of flour, just a tiny bit of oil. Make a cake for me first. Bring it to me. Well, how can she do that? Here she would be taking away the last bit of food right out of her dying son's mouth. How horrible of Elijah to even expect that or ask that. And yet it is about our perspective of faith, isn't it? Because then he tells her, if you will do that, then your jar of flour will never run out. And the jug of oil will never diminish. You will always have another handful. It isn't that she's going to be rich and that she's going to have lots of supplies, but it will never run out. And so now she's faced with a dilemma. Do I believe? Do I believe this prophet who's just come into town and tells me that I can have food that will be there if I give it to him first? Or do I feed my dying son and take the last drop of food that I have and give it all to him, knowing that it's over, knowing that I'm going to die? It is such a hopeless situation. And the fact of the matter is, Elijah has caused it. In his battle against sin, he has prayed that there would be no rain. And Ahab, the wicked king, has not responded yet. And so he has caused this drought. He has caused this condition for this woman and her son. She should be angry with him. And yet she is the example Jesus uses as someone who believes. Now, Elijah is outside the country of Israel. He's gone to someone else. This God is not her God. And so he is outside the nation of Israel to a woman who does not have covenant with him. And here she is. What do I do? And yet she responds to Elijah. And she goes and makes the cake and brings it to Elijah. And then she goes back. We should have the video, right? Is there going to be oil in the jar? Is the handful of flour going to be there as she sticks her hand in? What does she find? Well, of course, there's another handful of flour. And the passage reads that she will never run out. The passage goes like this. And she went and did as Elijah had said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. And the jar of flour was not spent. Neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he had spoken by Elijah. That's found in 1 Kings 17, verse 15 and 16. What amazing story. I like stories with happy endings. I like stories that are about God and about his power and about the miracles of God. And yet, when you really think about this story, this story was not about what God could do for her. This story is about her faith. And would she take 
the last bite out of her dying son's mouth and use it for God? Does she believe in God that much that she could take the very last thing that she has and give it to God knowing that God will provide? that God will be there, that God can, but it it doesn't matter. That she believes in God so much that she would give it to him anyway. It isn't in order to get that. But she believes it. And sure enough, everything becomes true, everything she had said, and she is provided for, for her, for her son, for Elijah, for all of them, for the rest of the time. It isn't that God made her rich. But God provided all she needed. And when we look at this story, it is such a huge contrast to the Pharisees and to the people of the town who are sitting there saying, well, Jesus, you've been doing a lot of miracles. We've been seeing this. Why don't you come back and you do for us here too? They're not offering him anything. There's no praise. There's no respect other than Why don't you provide for us what you've provided for everybody else? It's all about us. It's all about me. It's all about our town. Surely you would come back to your hometown and you would heal and do everything here because we think you can benefit us. And a faith that is about the benefit God can do for us is too small a faith. The prayer that prays about the benefit God can do for us without our commitment to him and what we are willing to do for him is not the kind of faith Jesus is looking for. And so they were looking for, well, you could heal us. You could do, and Jesus is just pushing harder. He says, there wasn't any faith in Israel like this woman, like the woman who is able to give the very last that she has in a hopeless situation to God and to use it for God, to use it for God's profit, knowing it will be completely gone. She can't ever get it back again. But she believes beyond that to what else God can do. And sometimes that's what we look for. What else can God do with what we would give? And anytime God asks for something from us, Maybe we should answer that part first before we would ask God and say to God, why don't you do for me? Because maybe God asks of us first, what is it that we do for him? How do we respond in faith to him? She believes in the face of this disaster that God still acts. We are not the center. It is not all about us. And if we claim to have any faith in God, then we know that God is more important and that it is not as important for God to be able to act for us and to be able to heal everything that we have and make life comfortable and easy for us. It is more important that God is glorified. It is more important that we see God, that he is honored, that he is lifted up, that he is holy, and that we would recognize that and that we would treat him that way. And of course, when we treat him that way, he responds to us. Don't get it backwards. It's more about him than it is about us.